Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're having a little bit of technical issues, so uh, hopefully we'll go live here soon. Um, I want to thank everyone for arriving in this virtual space together for our opening dialogue in a new series called Imagining and Shaping a Borderlands Pluriversity. We'll be hosting three more events this spring on March 10th, March 31st, and April 14th. Uh, please look out for email reminders, however you found out about this event, and put those events in your um, calendars. Thank you all so much for being here today. I'm Dulcinea Lara. I'm a many generations native of this southern New Mexico borderlands region. On both my parents' sides, we're rooted in indigenous ancestry and also claim Chicana, Chicano, Mexican American identity going back six and seven generations on this land before it became a borderlands. I'm also the director of the Borderlands and Ethnic Studies program at NMSU and a member of the emergent group, the Pluriversity Imagination Collective. We are a collective facilitating an intellectual and feminist inquiry about how to de-link from the structures of colonialism, racism, heteronormativity, and the overall matrix of, of colonial, um, the overall colonial matrix of power. In light of the current state of humanity, we are inviting ourselves and all of you to think otherwise about how we can function as a place of learning together and solving problems together. We imagine a space of learning and problem solving founded on an ethics and practice of generativity rather than productivity, collectivity rather than individual rigor, abundance rather than scarcity, and equity rather than meritocracy. Rather than a university that promotes singular and linear ways of making knowledge, we are imagining a borderlands pluriversity, a place of knowledge making that requires epistemic diversity and celebrates a human-centered framework. As a land-grant Hispanic and minority-serving institution on indigenous land, our collective pushes beyond institution-stated land acknowledgements to be in respectful and reciprocal relationships with indigenous people living here, whose knowledges are vital to the health and thriving of this region, its people, plants, animals, water, and all living things. I wanna take this chance to um, thank the sponsors of this dialogue series, Chicano Programs, the College of Arts and Sciences Equity Fellows, the Southwest and Border Cultures Institute, and the Borderlands and Ethnic Studies Program. We look forward to making this a recurring series and we welcome new sponsors as we grow. Finally, thank you so much to my scholar sisters in the Pluriversity Imagination Collective, Dr. Manal Hamse, Dr. Judith Flores Garmona and Dr. Georgina Badoni. I'm so grateful to be working with all of you as we persevere in cultivating a spirit of kindness, of coexistence and re-existence, and as we work together to restore dignity and justice in all the spaces we inhabit. This group is porous and open to collaboration with visionaries who are rooted and in a commitment to equity and land-based indigenous knowledges and pedagogies of resistance. There's plenty of room at the table and plenty of work to go around. And now for our amazing guests, um, before our amazing guests, um, I wanna thank our technical guru, uh, Jonathan Moreno, who uh, we literally couldn't be here without you and we're figuring it out as we go. So thank you all. I don't, I don't see lots of faces, but I hope there's uh, an audience out there for these incredible guests we have today. So on to our amazing guests. Um, I'm so happy to invite our former NMSU colleagues back to virtual Las Cruces to share their wisdom, vision, and expertise about today's state of affairs. I'm so proud to call these scholar activists my sisters in the work. First, Dr. Lisa Grayshield. Lisa. Dr. Grayshield is a member of the Washoe Tribe of Nevada and California. She earned her PhD in counseling and education psychology at the University of Nevada, Reno. She was recruited to NMSU in 2006, received tenure and promotion in 2012, and resigned in 2017 after serving at Standing Rock, North Dakota, with thousands of people from all over the world who understand their role as stewards of Dila Edi, Washoe for Mother Earth. 
She has since submerged herself in the learning and advancement of indigenous healing practices, including numerous forms of mind-body healing modalities, ceremonial practices, including numerous forms of mind-body of activism sh directed at shifting the Western gross national product paradigm to an indigenous paradigm of sustainability. Also working with ceremonial practices with master plant teachers. Dr. Grayshield continues to write, teach, and provide services devoted to the promotion of indigenous knowledge as a viable and practical vehicle for addressing the challenges faced in achieving optimal health and well being in individuals, families, communities, and the world. She was featured in a recent documentary, which I can't wait to watch, Lisa, um, titled Indigenous Ways of Being, that won Best Documentary at the Dream Machine International Film Festival in 2020. Dr. Gray Shield recently co-authored a book titled Handbook of Indigenous Ways of Knowing and Counseling Theory, Research and Practice. Welcome, Dr. Gray Shield. And Dr. Jenny Luna. Dr. Luna was born and raised in East San Jose, California granddaughter and daughter of migrant farm workers and cannery workers. She is the first in her family to attend and graduate college. She received her undergraduate degree in Chicana Chicano Studies and Mass Communications from UC Berkeley, a master's in education from Teachers College, Columbia University, and an MA and PhD in Native American Studies from UC Davis. She's currently an associate professor in Chicana Chicano Studies at California State University, Channel Islands. Dr. Luna has been practicing, been a practicing doula for 15 years and a danzante for 30 years. Her research focuses on the contemporary history and diaspora of danza Mexica Azteca tradition and its impact on Chicanex, indígena, identity, culture, and spirituality. As a dance activist scholar, Dr. Luna incorporates Nahuatl language study, decolonial scholarship, indigeneity, Chicana spiritualities, traditional birthing methods, reproductive justice, and indigenous food and healing practices. She is active in the ethnic studies K through 12 movement and her most recent article, 1999 Third World Liberation Front at UC Berkeley, an intergenerational struggle for ethnic studies was published fall 2019 in Ethnic Studies Review, special issue on the 50th anniversary of the founding of Ethnic Studies from the University of California Press. She has authored chapters in the following books, Voices from the Ancestors, Chicanex and Latinx, Spiritual Expressions and Healing Practices, and Decolonizing Latinx Masculinities, both published by the University of Arizona Press. Welcome, Dr. Luna. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Our, it seems like we're rolling. Yes, fantastic, exciting. I want to uh, let the audience know that we um, brought these two wonderful scholars at the same time to be in dialogue with each other and in dialogue with us. I feel very fortunate. Um, we're going to start with Dr. Luna, who's going to give us some kind of historical context. And then we're going to move to Dr. Grayshield to give us a sort of present context of where we are now. So the floor is yours, Dr. Luna. Thank you so much. And I first need to uh, just express how grateful I am to have been invited. And it feels like a, a coming back to um, my New Mexico family. And, and I'm so honored and grateful to be invited um, back to NMSU where I was a faculty for two years, very important two years in my life. And, uh, and I'm so grateful to see some uh, familiar folks here. And, uh, but especially uh, the organizers of this event, Manal, Judy Bucinea, and uh, there's those I, that I don't know, but you three were definitely, um, you know, lifelines and just such powerful uh, mentors and colleagues. And so um, although I'm at a different university, you are all still my colleagues and, and friends. And then of course, Lisa, this is a tremendous honor to be speaking with Lisa on this panel because Lisa is also a, a mentor and a teacher personally, not just not in academia, but in, in, in the spiritual world and really um, such, a, such an important guide for me. So I'm just so thankful to have this opportunity. So thank you all. And so I was invited to, um, to discuss uh, thinking about the history, and I have the X history, her story, but really our story of colonization and decolonization. 
Um, and so I would like to begin there. And with a quick, Ready? just sort of overview of a definition. So colonization and patriarchy. Um, the first method of colonizing indigenous peoples of this continent was to destroy their relationship to the land, to the earth, and to their ceremonies. And so really this work that I'm presenting is, is just to sort of a, a 101 of, of how do we begin to think about where we've come from and where we're going. And part of this movement to decolonize essentially just means that it's time to reconnect to the earth. That how have we been dehumanized? How have we been de-indigenized? How have we been removed? from our origins of, of who we are as people. And so again, just some basic uh, tenets in the premise of, of this talk is thinking about how do we decolonize and indigenize knowledge. So decoloniality is the engagement with critical ruptures and resources of those who have been marginalized. And it's about examining the indigenous thinkers, philosophers, um, you know, who are the women, the thought makers, the ethnic studies scholars? And it's also really about critiquing our civilization because no other civilization has led to the destruction of our planet as we have. So that's the premise. But in order to really think about, well, where is it that we came from? How, you know, what are the complexities of our identities, of how we engage with this knowledge? And so it begins with thinking about before 1492, you know, thinking about what did people call themselves before 1492. And so on this image, um, you know, when out this continent from Alaska to Argentina, think back to your elementary school days when the map that they would show you was really a grid. It was a uh, land that was divided by borders. And that's the way that we've sort of framed um, the world around us. And instead, when we think about this continent, we should be thinking about it as one land and one people and the ways in which indigenous peoples have always migrated, have always traversed, were caminantes de la tierra, that have always walked this land. And when we begin to look at, you know, this continent as Turtle Island, as, you know, the land from which we come from, um, this is sort of the map that I would prefer to use um, when referring to the land. And then when we think about the identities, we have to begin to think about what did people call themselves? And so for most of us, and I usually ask this question on day one of my students, you know, what did people call themselves before 1492? And the responses usually are very few. They might say Native American, and then I have to remind them, well, what did people call themselves? And even the names that we know or the names that we've been taught are not the names that they called themselves. And we have to begin by what did people call themselves? So for example, uh, the, the Navajo, they didn't call themselves the Navajo, the Dene, the Aymara, didn't call themselves Aymara, they were Runasini. Uh, the Mixteco called themselves, the names that they called themselves was Musabi. And so when we go back and we begin to peel the layers of all the indigenous peoples from the tip of Alaska to the tip of Argentina, and we think about what are the names that people called themselves. And when we find the languages and the names that people called themselves, what we understand is all of those names essentially mean the people in their respective language and connected to their responsibilities to the earth. Maybe they're caretakers of a particular place or a river or mountain, people of in the Mapuche um, of Chile. Mapu is mountain in their language. Che is people, they're people, they're mountain people. And so when we understand what does it mean to be human and what does it mean to be a person, people of the earth, that is, the, that is lesson number one, is trying to understand when we go back to the core of what people call themselves and how they identify themselves, they are people. But that process of being of personhood, of being a human, of being a person, of being people, um, by 1482 to 1821, we experienced 300 years of colonization. So Colón, Cristóbal Colón, colonización, um, it reminds us of that moment in time 
that all of these identities and responsibilities and connections to the land were erased. And so that, that naming was reduced, all of those thousands of names across this continent were reduced to the term Indian. And what we are taught in school about how uh, this term Indian, how people were named Indian, um, we can go back and, and actually it, the, the origin of that comes from the, the diaries of Christopher Columbus who, who saw indigenous peoples living and, and described them as living with God or in God, innocent children, peaceful, and said they are en Dios, they are living en Dios which became Indios and over time becomes the term Indian. And so this contentious term is really part of a colonial legacy of naming and is still a name that um, again, can be very contentious. And then uh, through that 300 years of, of colonization, we experience this very complex caste system where the caste system was a hierarchical uh, uh, a categorization of people based on race, on, on racial identity. And, and it was a very arbitrary categorical system. So you had 53 different kinds of people. So on the top were the peninsulares, those from Spain and the criollos that were born on this land, but who came from Spain. And then you have, you know, 50 other categories. And at the very bottom, you have indio y negro. And then you have the term mestizo, ladino, mulato, and all of these terms in between, as well as you have, um, you have categories like no te entiendo, I don't understand what you are, sal si puedes, get out if you can, and very obscure terms to label people based on this racial hierarchy. And so you see the Miguel Cabrera Caspas paintings that sort of allude to uh, these different mixtures and categories. Well, by the 1800s, after 300 years of, of Spanish colonialism, um, by the 1800s, uh, we have these independence movements. And 1791, it's, it's led by the Haitian Revolution, which you know, Haiti becomes the first uh, Black Republic in the Western Hemisphere. And so by revolting against the French, this inspires all of Latin America. So by the 1800s to the, to the 1840s, you have these independence movements where Mexico wins its independence from Spain and, and all the countries of Central America. And what takes place is this formation of the nation state throughout the continent. So again, we start with that, that map of the continent that I first show you, and then slowly we see a grid of borders from north to south and with manifest destiny from east to west as the land becomes uh, marcated by by flags and borders. And these borders, of course, are arbitrary and fluid, but it's at this moment that people become named by their nation state, wherever they happen to be. Um, so you become Mexicano, Peruano, Salvadoreño, Guatemalteco, et cetera. And yet you have places like Chiapas, which at one point was part of Guatemala and becomes annexed and part of Mexico. So all of these shiftings, uh, shifting of borders and place um, has an impact on the identity and the understanding of, of who we are as people. And then with these, with these terms like mestizaje, this idea that somehow if we can become um, mestizo or mestiza, and this, this idea was that we can sort of distance ourselves from, from who we are as indigenous peoples. And so there's this whole myth and legacy of this colonial caste system and you know, the philosophies of Josef Asconcelos um, with the Raza Cosmica, which basically stated that our people come from you know, the, the European empires of, um, of, of Spain. And, and, we, and we also come from the empires of the Aztecs and created this very mythological identity of the Aztecs coming together in this mestizo identity. And so, of course, that isn't the reality. This was a fantasy idea of, of who people were, a void of the complexities and the violence that takes place as a result of the mestizaje. So by 1848 to the 1950s, um, you know, the signing of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo and, and right there in New Mexico, um, you know the shifting borders right there in Mesilla, how those borders shifted between 1848 
um, within a few years was Mexico, was it the United States? And so now after 300 years of colonialism by the Spaniards, we now experience another 100 years of further colonization and this creation of the Mexican American identity and being foreigners in your own land, um, the deep racism that takes place as a result of American colonization and the building of the US nation state. And of course, the very first law of the land in the United States, uh, the very first was who has the right to citizenship, which the, on the only people that had the right to citizenship uh, were, were white men at the very beginning. But this 1848 signing of treaty of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo really changes uh, the status in because with the signing, you have Mexicans who are, you know, primarily you have a you have very mixed or uh, origins of Mexicans in now living in this area now called the United States, and now they are going to become citizens, and so the idea of non-white citizenship takes place. So then, by the 1960s, you have uh, the the El Movimiento Chicano or the Chicano movement which is the only time in our history since before 1492 that we named ourselves and this self-naming and self-identity was deeply rooted in our indigeneity. So this is an incredible feat because we're talking about, you know, 400 plus years of colonization. And then all of a sudden, you know, try transforming a people that for so long have been conditioned since birth and for generations about their identity and the ways in which they should approach their identity, that their identity was their destiny. And then all of a sudden by the 1960s comes along a group of young people calling for revolution and a connection um, to liberation and self-determination. And so this movement very much aligned with, you know, the American Indian movement, uh, the black power movement, the Asian power movements, all of these movements that, that sort of rise up um, simultaneously um, were calls for self-determination and for liberation. And so again, we have this uh, movement that coincides with this very strong ideological transformation that's taking place both in Mexico and the United States as people in Mexico begin to push for uh, a society that is not, that is multi-ethnic, that is an acknowledgement of a pluri-ethnic society and nation acknowledging indigenous peoples all throughout uh, the country, uh, peoples who had been ignored. And then you have in the United States, places like Chicano Park in San Diego. Um, there's one out in El Paso as well, where people find ways of self-determination to take over pieces of land, to claim it as, as sacred spaces, as sovereign spaces. And so I'm sharing all of this brief history as I try to come to a few uh, points that I would like to share in this conversation of how do we move towards uh, decolonization. And so identity ultimately is complex because we're dealing with forced religious conversion programs, torture programs, missionization, forced removal of people, detribalization, de-Indianization, exploitation and extraction, slavery, genocide, blood quantum, you know, versus indigenous identity. You, you are able, you can have a ethnic identity and a political identity. So you have native people and uh, coming from California where we have the most diverse uh, multiple nations of indigenous peoples across California, but many of them are not federally or state recognized. So ethnically they're native, but politically they are not. And then you have you know, language and indigeneity that is constantly changing as a result of migration, urban settlement, and you know, re and different movements for reclaiming indigenous indigenous identity for benefits of land and rights. So it is complex when we are talking about where we came from. So again, we began before 1492 with knowing who we are as people, as humans, knowing the names that we call ourselves, the languages that we speak, and we went from that reduced to Indian, and then for 300 years, a caste system that racialized us and where to be Indian or black was the worst thing you could be, was to be dehumanized. And then we went from that uh, to now becoming named as part of the nation state, 
being becoming Mexican, becoming uh, Salvadorian, based on wherever you happen to be on this continent, being part of the United States, being American. And so all of these, this naming were names that have been imposed that have nothing to do with, with our humanity or who we are. And so by the 1960s, again, it is the first time that a people named themselves through the Chicano movement, the Chicana and Chicano movement. And so that is significant. And so to have dealt with all of these issues in identity and yet to arrive to a place where our, our indigeneity, our, our right to name ourselves, our self-determination and our sense of liberation was still intact, that is um, something to, to be acknowledged. So really what we're thinking about is between 1492 and 1992 was 500 years of resistance. And now we're in a moment from 1992 to 2,492, the next 500 years of restoration. And so we are in this process of reclaiming. Uh, those of us who come, who have a, a connection, an ancestral connection to this continent, we were people that were not meant to survive. And yet here we are. And we, and we are here because of the resistance of our ancestors. And so it is our responsibility. It is part of who we are in our DNA. It is part of our genetic memory to reclaim, to heal and to reconnect. And to think about our, our consciousness, our consentización, how do we raise our consciousness, not only of ourselves, but of our family and those around us? How do we build community? And so many of us who didn't grow up with these traditions, it's again, we weren't meant to survive. That's why we didn't learn these traditions. We are the descendants of those who fought for our survival and our existence. And we are living a prophecy, the prophecy left by our ancestors uh, that we would return, that we would be able to share our ceremonies in public, that we would be able to not have to be in hiding, that we wouldn't have to hide our identity. And so I have an image here of the eagle. This is actually coming, this comes from a Mayan uh, codex um, of the Confederation of the Eagle and the Condor. And so this image reminds us uh, that the eagle nations of the North and the Condor nations of the South, that that was the prophecy that we would come together. That was a prophecy left by not just uh, Mayan communities, but this is a prophecy that uh, was interwoven between indigenous communities throughout the continent, that there would be a time of healing where all nations of the continent, North and South would come together. And that's where we're at right now. And so the last piece that I wanted to share is, well, then how, how, do, how do I live this prophecy in my own life and my own teaching and the way that I live and the way that I bring that part of myself into the classroom? And so for me, it's through danza, danza mexica. And so these are a few images of my danza group. And you can see uh, uh, in a very quick summary, uh, danza and its sort of philosophy, and I'll show you another image here, um, danza, comes from the word mitotil, danza is the Spanish word, but mitotilitzli in Nahuatl means to tell a story through dance. Or shitontequisa is to salir de silencio or oscuridad, meaning to, to, to come out of the silence. It's a cosmic movement. And for us, when we dance, we dance in a circle and we are a mirror of, of, the, of the cosmos. That each of us, we dance in the very center of our circle uh, is the fire, just like the sun. You know, we dance the, like the planets because we're honoring that our all of our solar system, um, everything around us is always in movement and dance and that the planets are dancing, the sun is dancing um, always. And so when we dance, we are honoring that cosmic movement. When we dance, we are moving in, in harmony with the world because the movement of the earth means movement of time and that life will continue. And so in a very basic nation this is part of what we do when we dance and we dance for the people we dance for healing for, for ourselves and in honor of all life around us and so these are just a couple of images you know everything that represents the circle of life the tree the the, the trees you know the flowers the fruit the animals in our regalia all of it represents uh being in harmony with with the circle of life. And so these are some of the altars that um, my group 
uh, makes for different ceremonies. Um, these are, are we, we honor the four directions, we honor the waters, and we also honor the trees. And so we, there are many different dance traditions that uh, have very similar universal belief systems. Uh, this particular dance tradition um, of the voladores that come from Papantla, Veracruz, and also in Puebla, um, it's before the dance happened, very similar to uh, the sun dance, the Lakota sun dance, very similar to the, the indigenous peoples of Hawaii that, that pray to the tree before they cut it down to build the canoe. Um, this is a, a particular ceremony where to cut down the tree, it's the ceremony of Sonteki. Sonkali in Nahuatl is hair, Tekit is to cut. So the cutting of the, the, the hair of Mother Earth, the trees. And so they build uh, this, this tree which they will use to dance, the, the dance of the voladores. And so what you see here is the people are connected by a rope and they're to their foot. And um, that represents the umbilical cord. You know, this is the tree of life. And so we, and that tree of life and, and what we, when we dance is we're honoring that we are human. That goes back to that we are people, that all of us come from the original tree of life, which is the placenta. And so I love placentas. I'm also a doula. So I love looking at placentas. I think they're beautiful because it looks like a tree. And so when we do our ceremonies, we are honoring the tree of life that all of us came from, which is the placenta, that all humans, because we're people, honor this, this placenta, this original tree of life. And so for myself, when I utilize danza yeah. um, in my teaching and in my life, it is a praxis for spirituality and liberation of the people. Because in its essence and its practice, danza resists the mainstream ideas of individualism, patriarchy, human arrogance. Uh, culture is constantly shifting in the light of the community. So collectively, we have to come to understand our culture as applied to our actual life and circumstances today. <clears throat> we have to examine our history, our language, um, our structures, our texts, our oral tradition, and our histories, her stories, our stories. Um, and each generation has to ask themselves and others, what does liberation look like today? How do we apply these teachings to our actual lives? And so that's the work that I do, but that's the work that so many of my colleagues do as well. Uh, my indigenous and, and Chicanx colleagues that we, we look to our, our histories, we look to our stories, we look to uh, what has been left to us by our ancestors. And we go back to the basics. We, you know, what are the lessons? We go back to the basics. We focus on the four elements, the fire, the earth, the water, the air. We focus on generosity, respect, healing versus resentment, growth. And we outreach to those that have been marginalized even within our own circles and we continue to grow. So we honor the great mystery, we honor creation and we honor our experiences in the present because our present is subjected to empire, imperialism, neo-colonialism, and political agendas. So we have to consider the questions of justice living in a stratified society, that these things go hand in hand, that we experience our life as spiritual people, but also living in this uh, very political world. So uh, lastly, you know, this is, this is my last slide here is, so how do we live in community? These are questions, I don't know if I have the answers to them, but I'm posing more questions things to think about, to contemplate. How do we live in community? How do we truly live in community? How do we put ancestral knowledge into praxis? You know, it's one thing to study, read, learn the knowledge, but how are we living it? You know, I think about my Chicana feminist uh, foremothers, thinking about living Chicana theory, the theory in the flesh, that when we take time to critically reflect what it means to live in your body and your brown skin or your light skin, you are experiencing theory, ideas, experiential knowledge, and understandings of yourself. So having a deeper relationship with yourself can be the hardest one to develop. And so um, that's just a little piece I wanted to share so I can um, pass it on to my beautiful colleague and friend, uh, Lisa Grayshield. Uh, this is how you can contact me. And these are some of, uh, if you wanna read some of my work or publications, that's where you can find it. Thank you.
Got it. Okay. Gracious, I made you co-host and you should be unmuted. Okay. Great, we got it then. Um, well, I wanna say, Hunga Maheji, Washo de Motmoket, Letle, Kashinati, Digam Dia, Dr. Lisa Gracious. Um, I wanna say it's an honor to be here and say thank you, you know, to the organizers and um, Dulcinea and Jenny, you know, and you know, everybody who's been a part of bringing all of us together to talk about these things. Um, so it's an honor to be to ask to be asked to come back. And I do have some slides, but you know, there's this is such a big topic. When I think about it, you know, um, Dr. Luna, all the things that you just shared about the earth, the fire, the water, the air, and all of these things, you know, the talk that I'm giving really is to help us to, to sort of understand that paradigm differentiation. Because, you know, the way that we frame how we think about our world informs the decisions and the choices that we make. And what we can see as a collective is that things have been framed from a gross national product kind of point of view. And, um, and there's a conflict with a lot of us, especially, you know, people who are connecting with that indigenous side of us, you know, so, um, uh, I'm really grateful to be able to talk and um, to uh, to present to here. Um, Elba, I see you too. I saw you come on board, so I just want to say hello. Um, wish I was on campus with everybody, uh, having coffee and and enjoying our time like that. But it's good to be here. Um, So I'm sharing my screen and this is actually, um, I like this photograph because this, this was taken at Mexico State when I first started teaching there and uh, I was asked to be the head woman dancer. And then my daughter was asked to be the head girl dancer. So at, at the powwow and, um, you know, and, you know, I remember my friend Joe, uh, we were saying, hey, I grew up going to powwows, so it wasn't a big deal for me. And Joe was like, hey, you know, Pueblos, we didn't really do powwows, but he was totally in support of me. But, you know, it's like, wow, you know, we got the natives, even the natives here in this area, we still have, you know, practices that the local people, you know, don't, don't normally do too. So we have a lot, long ways to go and kind of learning about each other. And, um, but it was an honor to be a part of that powwow and to see so many native people that were active in the community as well too. Um, uh oh, it's not. I'm not. It's not going down. Can you see the PowerPoint? Is it visible? Yes, but it's not on slide um, presentation mode. Oh, okay. I see. I see. Okay, this is um. Indigenous Ways of Knowing was a program that my students and I came up with when I was at in New Mexico State University. Um, so I'll just, I wanted to talk a little bit about who I am and then I'll go back into this four directions model that we talked about. Um, uh -oh. <laughs> Lisa, if you click on the, the little icon on the left lower hand corner. Okay. Like a little, um right there okay um so you know obviously i'm a member of the washoe tribe and my tribal upbringing i'm half white and half native but my mom chose to live on the reservation and so we were raised around our people and um you know so it was really my educational process that allowed me to gain the words and the knowledge to understand the kind of oppressive circumstances that surround our communities. But I began to examine a little bit deeper because I realized that while I was going through my educational process, that it wasn't really having the impact that it needed to have on my community directly or the people that I care about. I was so stressed out and so busy trying to teach classes and adhere to curriculum and standards-based kind of education and um, uh, licensure requirements for counseling kinds of things that it was challenging to really to look to take a big look at the curriculum but as I began to become stressed in the system I needed to seek my healing and really understand the difference I'm a counseling educator 
And as I stepped into the academy, I realized that the paradigm of the academy is different. It doesn't think the way that I think. And so, you know, so, so as I began to actually look at the literature, I realized as a professor, I had been so busy becoming a professor and getting my PhD that I didn't have time to engage a lot of the literature and information until after I became a professor and found out that there, there are numerous other Native and Indigenous people that are coming into academia, kind of flooding into academia um, as a result of things like affirmative action that allowed us a hand up to actually get here. And so, so once I stepped in, I realized that there's a different thought process. So indigenous ways of knowing was the answer is what we came up with as we were trying to understand how to function in a structure that was not conducive to an indigenous thought process. And so I walk indigenous ways of knowing it's a healing, it's a healing paradigm. We engage our journey, we heal ourselves, our families, our communities, our land, the earth. What is good for us is always good for the earth mother. So what does it mean to be well? And I think that's probably the question here. I mean, we could cite all kinds of things that are going on in our world right now. We have, a, we have a, some political and social, um, social level disasters going on it, um, at our political structures. We have racism coming to an all time high right now, you know, across our country. We have um, information coming out about our medical system that is not providing the adequate care that we need. We're finding out that the food sources that we've been eating for generations now have impacted our body to such a degree that we're now suffering with, with diabetes and high blood pressure and all of these things that come along with engaging in a Western lifestyle and disengaging from who we are as indigenous people. And as I go on, I wanna to submit to everybody that we're all indigenous. That's why this conversation is so important that in our lineages, every one of us has a connection to an earth-based people that started out in a small sustainable living community. And the wisdom of that kind of living and that way of being connected to the land is coming back. We are in a paradigm shift right now. You know, we can see from the things that are going on from the new ways of interacting. And we can see by the uproar across the world in indigenous communities uh, as they take a stand for clean water, for clean air, they take a stand for land, they take a stand for the trees, they take a stand to, to keep the telescopes and company, big money from building huge telescopes on top of their sacred mountains. You know, they take a stand to, to try to get the, to stop the black snake from going underneath the earth. You know, another prophecy that we knew would happen, you know, when that black snake goes through the earth, you know, the Lakota have a prophecy. And the ninth one is Jenny, I wanted to say this because it lines up with what you were talking about. The ninth prophecy is the final prophecy. And it says that the rainbow tribe will come together. And this is that time. And when the rainbow tribe comes together, the prophecy says, the Lakota prophecy says, then it is finished. And so, you know, we're at that point of juxtation right now. We have to change. We must embrace the change. That's the way I see it. I'm having conversations on numerous levels with, um, with different groups and people on decolonizing our mind and decolonizing the way that we live and what next steps do we take um, the, and these kinds of things. So the conversation is happening. So what does it mean to be well? I wanna to try to not waste all my time by chit chat, but I wanna talk about what does it mean to be well? Self-actualization and self-determination. Those two things direct our attention to an inward journey, not an external pursuit for some sort of success, but an inward journey of interconnectedness. Self-actualization, the desire for self-fulfillment, namely the tendency to become actualized in one's potentiality, which I like to call reaching our highest expression. Self-determination, um, normally associated with the right of nations to self-determine as they government government to government relationships between federal and state governments and federally recognized Native American Indian tribes with respect to sovereign rights. However, it is applied here as a construct 
of self-determination theory, a theory of motivation that's concerned with supporting our natural or intrinsic tendencies to behave in effective and healthy ways. So indigenous ways of knowing, it's, a, you know, this was published in a, in a journal article in 2011 in the journal for uh, counselors for social justice, social action. And this was an, it, this is a, just an overall definition of what indigenous ways of knowing is as a paradigm. I do want to get, I, I want to move as quickly as I can. So I'm just going to let you skim over that. And then I want to move through this because I want to get to, to the part that where we're gonna talk about what it actually means to be well, what's happening in a community that's functioning on a generative side and building positivity within our, within our world, which is, the, which is what my view of what the university was, is to be about, you know, is an institution that assists us in our growth process, as opposed to promoting specific constructs that have to do with gross national product as opposed to real health and wellness and healing for our world. So I'm going to move on from the definition. So seven um, directions, there's a lot of ancient wisdom about how to be well, right? There's directional models. This makes sense because it's holistic. Body, mind, soul, and spirit. The elementals, earth, fire, water, and air. You know, all of these things that we break these up so that we can begin to understand something as a whole. So there's a lot of ancient wisdom out there about what this is. When I, in counseling, we talked about the healing domains as the body, mind, soul, and spirit. These are the areas that we can work in. And there's the indicators of being well or above, below, and all around. Above meaning our connection to who we are as an ancestral being or as, as a person, as a human, as a cultural being. And below our connection to the earth and all around would be our sense of self uh, and our sense of knowing that self-determination piece. Um, but honoring the honoring and the idea that the earth is alive, this is probably the most fundamental difference in the gross national product of a Western mind construct and what kind of, what runs our systems when it's based on money and numbers and measurement and those kinds of things is that we are the value structure is different, com, entirely different when we come to what at the end of the day, it's not about that dollar. It's not about the dollar. It's about our connection to the earth. And we can see by looking all around in our, in our world and just taking a little bit of look on the news, we can see what's going on. How, am I doing okay on time? Okay. This is one of my students. I, I wanted to put her picture in here. She was, she's a Navajo student, Navajo medicine woman, Dr. Marilyn Begay, who graduated from our program also. And um, when we were doing a program called Indigenous Ways of Knowing in Counseling, and um, she has gone on to be quite a powerful medicine woman in her community. Her research is amazing, and I would love to talk more about her research and the significance of it. But it essentially um, is it, um, it it culminates into some conclusions about how we can tell if we're well and what we need to do to get there. And so and. So these, these are, I, there's seven I walk indigenous ways of knowing healing states that come out of the literature. And I just wrote a chapter and submitted it um, to a, a book. And then this also in, is in our indigenous ways of knowing book, which I have a picture of at the end of the slide presentation, I'll show you. But the healing states, you know, how do we know we're healed? You know, we can talk about trauma till we're red in the face, right? We have trauma, we deal with that. And those are things we need to know about. And we need to be versed in our ability to relate with one another based on trauma kinds of constructs. However, how do we know we are well? How do we know our system is well? How do we know the university is functioning in a way that is bringing a generative state of being into the world? How do we know this? So here's what we came up with in the literature from indigenous, privileging indigenous people and indigenous voices who have that value structure of earth. Um, so true healing happens at a community level. Okay, we know this. There's a lot that can be said about this. We can write a book on how important it is to engage at a community level. Um, number two, earth is, the earth is the source of all food and medicine. And we have enough information in our world to know that the toxins in our food sources have caused problems. And that um, 
that the way that we market food, the way that we process it and package it and send it, you know, we all know that there are, that we're having challenges now with toxic food substances and foods that have high sodium, such high sodium content that they're causing further problems. And I know this because I have an aging, ailing father with diabetes who, you know, likes to have a can of Spam. And so, you know, we, we learn these behaviors and these, and they become addictions. And then we deal with them in our communities at so many different levels because of losing that connection. So the earth is the source of all food medicine. When we turn to Western medicines, we find the same kinds of things. But when we turn to indigenous medicine and we get out into nature and we put our feet on the ground and when we look, learn about the plants that are, that are out in nature and we make our teas and we remember how we, how we prayed to our food before we hunted or we remembered the seasons and when we gathered pine nuts and when we gathered roots and when we, you know, each, each thing that we did throughout the seasons, when it was time to do those things and to stay connected in that way. So the earth is the source of all food and medicine. And native ceremonies always include earth, fire, water, and air, whether it be a sweat lodge ceremony or a sun dance ceremony or a Native American church ceremony or you know, ceremonies in Central America or Africa. You know, all of these ceremonies bring us back to that very fundamental knowing of the earth, of we are earth beings. We come from the earth. It's very important for us to maintain that connection. That's what our ceremonial practices do and to respect the earth as we move forward so that we can make a place for seven generations to come. Think in that way, to think to our seventh generations, then we're not concerned about that almighty dollar. Number three, water is life. The rise of the mini Wachoni movement, water is life movement that happened at Standing Rock. Indigenous people have been speaking up for their lands since time immemorial, since they've had to. But Standing Rock really put a, a big lens on the environmental movement that's happening across our world. And I'm trying to remember the name of the young, um, the young woman, Greta, Greta, who has just started a movement amongst people about, about caring for the earth. So I'm just really grateful for that because we're all indigenous and we're all in this together. And so the solutions and the education that we provide really need to be in such a way that our teachers are not the numbers and the statistics that we're running, but our teacher becomes the earth itself, the water that we drink to have that clean water, the air that we're breathing. Because we know in places people have high incidences of bronchial diseases from having to breathe pollution. You know, so these kinds of solution is, are the, where our education needs to go to. How important it is to know about the organs in our body and how those chemicals that are in our foods, especially those processed foods, how they are digested into our body. We need to know that we have a gland in the middle of our head that's a pineal gland that helps us to sleep and regulate light energy as it comes in and out of our body. And the toxins in our food sub sources calcify that. And so we... You know, so, so we become kind of numb to the idea that we're putting things into our body that, that's not good for us. So the water is life movement. It's more than about just the water. It's about the sun too. We know that the sun is the best source of vitamin D. Let's go outside and experience that. Ancient wisdom ways and the ways of the earth and the people who live on the lands have a lot of information about those things because we've been honoring those ways for thousands and thousands of years. And while I'm only part Indian, my mom is European. She's got European ancestry and my father is native. I am indigenous on both sides. We're all indigenous. So that piece about being connected to the earth, it's not just a native thing. It's a paradigm. It's a way that we look at things. So I'm gonna move through these quickly. We learn our languages. Our languages reconnect us, those ancient languages. I like Sanskrit. Sanskrit is a beautiful ancient language that people are learning. It's a beautiful prayer language. Focus on the positive. We need to focus on these solutions. If we continue to have to run numbers about how many people have diabetes in our communities and how many people are obese in our communities, and, and if we're continuing to have to run these numbers and talk about health disparities, when are we taking the time to actually implement the solutions to reconnect us to the land or to create food sovereignty projects, which our communities are talking about now? So um, 
ceremonial practices reconnect us with spirit. It's important for us to remember those ceremonial practices that re, that remind us that we're earth beings. You know, we're spirit beings, but we're we're organic beings. Western science can teach us a lot about how our body functions. We have a lot of information about the way that our body interacts now. And we, we, know, we understand very well the environmental impact on that, uh, on that interaction. And now we have epigenetics and a whole slew of, of disciplines and fields that study life from a different vantage point. You know, so, but, and it's hard to, it's time to bring all that information together and recreate the systems that are the knowledge holders for our young people. You know, we have enough information now to change the curriculum so that it has meaning and it actually brings an impact in the way that we think. So um, the last one is social and restorative justice responsibilities. Just because we feel whole and healed and happy, you know, there may be people that are suffering. So it is our responsibility to level that playing field and step out and help where we can. Taking, always keeping in mind, taking care of ourselves. That's absolutely critical to take care of ourselves. So I walk, at, you know, I looked at it as a political and social movement and counseling psychology. Here's a, this is a book, Indigenous Ways of Knowing and Counseling. This is the book that uh, we just published. Um, my colleague, Dr. Don Pepion has a chapter in this book where he talks about the Lakota uh, ways of, or, or the, the Blackfeet way of knowing. And um, Dr. Marilyn Begay, who graduated for, with her PhD from the program, has, has her dissertation chapter in this book on the experiences of Native American psychologists who are also traditional healers in their communities and what they learned from training to practice about how to help people become well. And um, Dr. Laura Luna, has some chapters in this book as well. We, we did some research on looking at elders' knowledge of historical and intergenerational trauma and how to heal it. And um, <clears throat> she also has a chapter on mestizo consciousness and reclaiming her indigenous identity. Um, so there, and there's a number of other uh, really good chapters that are written by a number of, uh, you know, it's a number of essays that are in here and some research. So um, I recommend it, it's a good, uh, it it kind of represents my um, my time at New Mexico State University as a professor and some of the research that I did while I was there. Uh, so as I'm closing, though, you know, I just, you know, want to say which is, you know, go forth in a good way. I hope that something that I said can impress upon everybody the importance of reconnecting to our indigenous way of knowing, which means that we're reconnecting to our own highest expression, getting to know ourselves, you know, as members of a community. And um, it's important to remember that healing happens at a community level, you know, so we're all in this together, digam hiki hulel. It's time to get together to recognize that if the academy, if the university and the training structures do not change to meet the times today, seventh generation that is changing, that they're gonna get left behind and eventually the academy itself is not gonna be considered an intellectual pursuit for, for the helping professions or for whatever you know, we're trying to do. It's time that we recognize the structures in the world that are important and we begin to utilize the information that we have to bring it to bring community and to help each other out and to level the playing field and to and to not you know to 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 address those hardcore lines that say this is you and this is me and you stay out and you go here we are all re responsible for each other in this world today and you know and now we can see that our impact on the earth needs our attention in a good way the water that we drink you know we have to check the pH level we find out that it is very important in our overall health and wellness to drink good water. You know, our, our, you know so, so I, I hope that there's something that I have said that would assist in being able to engage the conversations that are gonna allow us to make the changes that we need to. I see young people of, and, and people of all ages are coming to our ceremonies. You know, we, my family is a ceremonial family and we, we conduct all kinds of ceremonies and we attend ceremonies and, and there are more, more non-native people in these ceremonies than there are native people today.
because, be, because our young people are beginning to understand at a deeper level than those of us who are older, at a deeper level, a much deeper level, the world that we're leaving them, the world that they want for their children. They're gonna have, they have children and they're gonna bring these children up in this world. And so um, I wanna thank you, Dr. Luna, for what you said too, that you know it, it's absolutely that's restorative justice piece. When I talked about those seven constructs of being well in a society, in a, you know, knowing that we're working towards being well, we're addressing all of those things. We, our awareness is in all of those things. And um, so thank you all. And thank you for listening to me. I'm really grateful that, um, that we can have this conversation. And I hope it spurs more conversations because we know that what we, what we think about is our prayers, but what we, or what, what we think about is what we create, what we're creating. But what we speak, my auntie told me, our words are prayers. Our words are prayers. So it's important that even the way we talk about things, that we talk about them in a way that we know we are bringing it together. We're not separate any longer. You know, digum hiki ang hula, we're all in this together. So we want to figure these things out, you know, low test scores in school or whatever issue is it is that we're doing in a way that we can do it different than we've been doing it before. So miangwa mi bi mi lao die yalo. Aho. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Grace Shield. Thank you, Dr. Luna. Um, I'm just inspired and flooded with, uh, with love, really, from your words and from your teachings. Um, I want to just make a couple comments and then ask you both um, uh, maybe one or two questions. But if we don't have time, I want to open up to the audience. Um, Dr. Luna, the, the history that you shared, the 500 years you, you um, made concise into 20 minutes, thank you so much. Um, I think we need to know this history. We need to know how we got here. Um, you know, I hear a lot about anti-bias training, anti-discrimination training, which gives people a lot of feelings of, of guilt or power or whatever, but it doesn't tell you where these ideas of anti-Mexicanness or anti-nativeness came from. So, so thank you so much for starting out this conversation with grounding information. Uh, Dr. Grayshield, um, gosh, thank you so much. Um, both of you are connecting in, um, in advising us in suggesting an inward journey, right? A self-reflection. Um, that we need to really get to know ourselves, know our, our, our background, our language, our culture, know our history um, before we even get to know each other. So, so like Dr. Greenshield said, we need to start today. We need to start yesterday. Um, and I, I want to really echo um, Dr. Grayshield's uh, invitation to be positive about this work. This work at the end of the day is about love. It's about healing. It's about generativity. It's about um, being kind, being compassionate. You know, those things that should kind of be part of our daily walk of life, it, it's missing. How do we put the heart back into our work? Thank you so much. Um, and, and, you know, and the last thing I want to say is we're all invited. <laughs> Dr. Gracial just invited all of us that we're in this moment of the, the rainbow tribe, that, that the prophecies are saying that we all have a place at this um, endless, vast table. And I think sometimes with this work, there's intimidation or nervousness. I'm not part of that group or this program or this club. It's this exclusive idea of radicalness. And it's not radical, it's reasonable, it's lovely. It's, it's what's gonna keep our water clean, everyone. Um, so anyway, I'm just so inspired and, and moved and, and grateful to the both of you. Um, so I just, I want to pose a question and, and we can start with um, Dr. Grayshield first and then go to Dr. Luna. Um, in the tradition of the, this new emerging group called the Pluriversity um, Imagination Collective, I, I want to ask, starting with you, Dr. Grayshield, um, we're working to, to think about, we're in the imagination stages, right? We're working to think about how we can move from a traditional university uh, concept of one way of language, one way of knowing, one way of assessing um, to a pluriversity structure that's much more inclusive, that's equitable. And I, I wanna ask you, Dr. Grayshield, um, how does your work help us envision that pluriversity, right? And not just NMSU, not just the school, the school systems, but what does an institution look like that shifts its focus on education in service to healing ourselves and communities? So if you can give us some thoughts on that. Well, that's a really big one. <laughs> that's a huge one. 
I remember a book when I was there called Indigenizing, Indigenizing the Academy. And, um, you know, we talked about what, what would education look like if it were coming from an indigenous perspective. And I, I just have to keep going back to that idea of the seven directions, you know, that we would learn and, and think of that in concentric circles with that center circle being our spirit, you know? So, you know, that's, that, that's when we know we're grounded because we can connect with our own spirit. We don't have to put ourselves off on anybody else or try to preach anything. We know who we are and we're contributing in a way that feels good to us. That's where we wanna go. That's where we wanna be. But oftentimes the next level that um, the soul that's in there. We don't really have words. There's not a language for that soul. It's the feelings and the emotions of pain or, or happiness or, you know, or terror or trauma that we pass on from generation to generation. And we need to heal up that soul wound. You know, there's a soul wound. There's a, an individual soul wound and a collective soul wound. And we really each do need to take our responsibility to heal ourselves. But the information we put out there needs to be information that allows others to do the same. And we're not all going to reach the same populations right away. We've got a lot of bridging work to do, a lot of bridging work to do. You know, right now I'm doing a lot of bridging work with, with, with assessment in Native American communities so we can maintain the funding that keeps our programs going. So anyway, that, so there's a spirit, then there's that next circle, which is the soul, and then there's the cognitive the mind, the way that we think. It's complex, it's psychology, it's impacted by culture, it's impacted by experiences, by nutrition. We know it's impacted by nutrition, all kinds of things. And then the very most simplistic one, but the one it, it is the, the, um, the physical domain, the earth, the things that measurement can give us information about. That's where Western science comes in handy. You know, how many this, how many that, what happens when you this, the studies show this, so we know we need to get rid of these chemicals. Now it's almost as if we're having to measure to show that we need to turn back to indigenous ways of knowing. That to me is where all the information has led us. Let's go back. Let's go back to ancient wisdom teachings. You know, when we enter into a school, our kids need to know how to take care of themselves. Instead, we're fighting over school lunches. You know, it's, it's like, you know, kids need to learn. There's so many skills that to taking care of ourselves, but instead we're so busy wanting everybody to learn different languages so that they can become big multimillionaires in business operations and make conglomerates of money. You know, when really happiness is, returns to our hearts as indigenous people, and we're all indigenous when we reconnect with the earth. So I think that in keeping in mind how to actually make, a, to, to create a framework where we can build something on, I would say we need to keep those things in mind, you know? And then, the, you know, it's body, mind, soul, and spirit above, below, and all around, you know, all around when that student comes onto our campus, we need to address those students in a way that helps them to feel good. I, in our master's in counseling program, and please forgive me, anybody who's in our program too, I saw some very stressed out students, students who tried to commit suicide because they were so stressed about getting their work done or keeping up or getting their poster in or these kinds of things, and then parting their asses off because they were so stressed. Then they did the opposite thing to try to de-stress and then causing problems. And then we had dramas going on. And I remember thinking, wow, this is just, you know, like, hold on a minute, you know, hold on a minute, you know, like we need to address ourselves before we think we can step outside and anybody can pass a set of standards. Anybody can pass a bunch of curriculum, but these kids were stressed and you don't learn and retain knowledge and information when you're that stressed. And I remember coming out of my education, you know, kind of being there. So we need to re-examine the culture of the whole campus, the structure. What does it mean to walk on campus as a student? In my mind, when I was a little girl, I lived, growing up on the reservation, I carried, my mom used to have all these dictionaries, all these encyclopedias, you know, those old encyclopedias. And she had a whole book and I'd open those encyclopedias and go through them and I'd carry them around like I'm going to college. I knew I was going to college. I was just a res girl, but I knew I was going to college. And I went to college and I had this idea about how it was gonna be so amazing. And, and it is amazing. I don't wanna down it too, because I have learned so much about myself and now my skills can act as a bridge to, my, to tribal programs and the work that I'm doing, I'm grateful. But if I could change it, 
I think we really need to address students at a whole level from where they're at from a non-competitive standpoint. So I didn't put a slide in here. I was gonna put a slide that talked about the paradigm of an indigenous paradigm and a Western paradigm so that we could actually see we're making our decisions, paradigm. I learned the word epistemology, you know? I learned that. I didn't know that one when I came in as a professor, but I learned it pretty quick and then I used it quite a bit because the epistemology, the underlying, you know, and, and ontology, the underlying value structure and the way that we see ourselves within that value structure, our understanding of the world, you know, those, those epistemology, it's fundamentally different. So we need to think about how to utilize the resources in order to support the natural, you know, the, the natural cycles of the earth and, and the seasons and humans and plants and animals and all those considerations. So thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you, Dr. Gray Shield, so much. Um, I just want to share that there's over 80 people watching, which is a testament to people seeking this kind of information and, and wisdom um, because they're making it here uh, to be with us. Thank you so much, Dr. Gray Shield. Um, and also, I'm feeling so relieved because you're saying the answers and the knowledge have already been there, are always already there. We just need to, to, to harness those ways of knowing and, and implement them into the ways that we do things. So I, I feel a lot of relief. I hope other people do on the call and thank you for sharing um, those truths. Uh, Dr. Luna, um, same question. I wonder if you can share a little bit about your thoughts. Uh, you're in higher education right now. You're in academia in California. Um, what are some of the shifts that we need to do in higher education that will make healing work within institutions even possible? Well, I think for me, I, well, first I want to acknowledge that everything begins in the dream space. So I, I really like that you're in the imagination place because I think that's really important. And, um, and first we have to be able to, before we can see something, we have to imagine it, we have to believe it. And so I think that's really important. But the first thing that came to mind was the, the Plan de Santa Barbara, which is the founding documents of, of Mecha, Chicano Studies. And, and the premise and the core belief of, of Chicana and Chicano studies, ethnic studies, that, and coming from the Plan de Santa Barbara, um, you know, the blueprint for, for Chicana and Chicano studies, the core belief is that we do not come to the university to work for them, but rather we demand that the university work for us, for our communities. And so we really have to shift the way that we think that, and, and the whole idea was this uh, bridging from, so maybe it's not just pluriversity, but it's also communiversity that how do we make these bridges between the university and the community? And that it's, it's really about demanding. And, and I remember in, in undergrad, we used to say that, you know, we're here to steal from the university. How do we take the resources and bring it back to our communities? Because everything that they have there has been stolen from us in the first place. And so how do we go back in and steal from the university? But then at the same time, we want to smuggle in some of our knowledge because a lot of, because they refuse to to accept our knowledge systems within that space. And so we create space. And so for, so it's this work that we're doing, which can be really hard, but I guess, um, you know, from my experience, I'm thinking about um, at the institutional level, um, I've been really fortunate that I have an institution that I, I have an idea and they are able to fund me to do whatever ideas I have. Um, I mean, it's just so basic that um, you have an idea. Okay, how can we support you to, to bring that into fruition? Um, you know, do you need a course release? Um, and so we have on our campus, um, I think it's an instructional related activities grant. And so you know, that's where it's through these grants that I am able to bridge and they believe in interdisciplinarity. That's one of the, the mission pillars of our campus that, um, you know, so I've worked, I've been really fortunate to work with um, uh, Dr. Lara's father to bring him to my campus and worked from Chicano studies and chemistry and how do we, and we talking about water. And so how do we make uh, connections? And oftentimes in our campuses, we live in these silos that we don't talk to each other, we don't interact, but yet the way to really um, dismantle the, the, the compartmentalization that exists within the university and the fact that our disciplines are not seen as, as uh, interconnected and that we have to begin to have these conversations and we have to begin to interconnect our disciplines because that's the only way that we're gonna shift not only how we think about the world and our individual studies, but how we, um, we really uh, shift the university into a place that it's interdisciplinary all around 
that we have to be able to, you know, I, in Chicana and Chicano studies, I teach reproductive justice. Um, I work with the health science, with nursing, and we create doulas in the community, women of color that are going out there and helping other women um, in birth. Um, I teach my classes in the community. I actually go to a local uh, farm worker housing community and I teach class there so that people in the community can take my class for free. And then my students get to be in the community and, um, and actually engaging with the very communities where this knowledge comes from. So uh, these are, we have to be creative and we have to think about how do we shift that the university is, is not just this institution within the community. Cause you have folks in the community who maybe have never stepped foot on, a, on the university campus that is in their own backyard. And so it's the job of the university to work for our communities. So we don't come to the university to work for them. We come to demand that they work for our communities. And part of the thing for us that have uh, this privilege of higher education is that we are able to use that privilege to seek dreaming and destinies and, and to seek the things that we love and have passion about. But many of our families did not because they worked because they had to put food on the table. So they didn't have the luxury of being able to um, imagine uh, new possibilities and to pursue passions that we have in life. And so that's, it's just difficult work that we have to do because we're trying to bridge all of these different things at once. Thank you, Dr. Luna. Um, so, so well said, uh, powerful words. Um, I have a lot of comments coming into the chat, just appreciating both of you uh, sending love, uh, hearts popping up. Um, Dr. Pepion, both of your colleague when you were here says, I appreciate Lisa and Jenny. It's good to see them again. They are some fine people. I echo Dr. Pepion's um, words and thoughts. I don't know if you wanna say something, Don, or uh, if anyone wants to, to say something, please type it in. I don't know if people can unmute themselves. I can try to maneuver that. If they uh, raise their hand, they, you can unmute them. Okay. Does anyone have a question, comment, uh, expression to share? We've, ha we've heard a lot today that's just so inspiring. I'm, pro I'm gonna be processing for a long time. I'm trying to see if I have any hands, comments. I see lots of students. This is your chance, be bold. Do you have questions, curiosities? I know, you, your professors are looking for you to ask questions. Extra credit for question asking. <laughs> um, Dr. Hamsa, do you have some thoughts? No, I want to encourage the learners in, uh, in my courses to uh, bring in their ideas because they are working on imagining a decolonial world in community all together as groups and maybe at the end as a big group. So it's your chance to ask uh, Dr. Jenny Luna and Dr. Lisa Grayshield anything that is gonna help you move forward, move forth. Angel raised um, his hand and then... Um... Okay. And then Elizabeth. <laughs> Angel Navarro Cruz, I, I think I've unmuted you. Hello? Hi, we hear you. Oh, okay, all right. Um, I just wanna say thank you to all of you, presidents and speakers. I um, wanted to acknowledge the point of like, like how uh, indigenous languages are like poetic and um, from like a Mexica or like Nahuatl standpoint, it's like they say Sochi la toquet which basically means a flowery speaker and how I think that really ties into like the legend of how uh, the rainbow people will come about because like we can enjoy the rainbow, right? Like we can see light, we can interact with it, but plants and flowers are what sustain us. They are the actual like accumulation between material and spiritual world. I just like, anyone have any thoughts? Sorry. Lisa, can you unmute yourself? Let's see. 
think you can unmute yourself there. There you go. Um, yeah, thank you for that. Um, yeah, plants, the, the plant people, we call them the standing nations. And, you know, I, I re reverted to refraining from all my scientific lingo because I don't have to do that now, you know, I'm, so I'm speaking as myself you know, trying not to, I'm not going to mask too much, but the standing nations are very much alive and have a lot to teach us. You know, we have some really powerful plant teachers. We have teas and tinctures and medicines and salves and all kinds of things. And, and these plants have a lot of healing to offer us as well. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, the, I, I think that, you know, it's important for us to, to sit with the plants, you know, I don't want to say too much more about that, but I am writing some, I'm writing a piece on some master plant teachers that, um, you know, have spoken to me in a lot of good ways. So. Yeah, I would just say it's, it's all about going back to the basics, just like what myself and, and Lisa are sharing. It's, it's where I'm um, in thinking about the water. I mean, the, uh, some of you might be familiar with, um, Dr. Moto, the Japanese scientist that did the work on the messages in water and, and examining the, um, the molecules in water. And, you know, the, we, our people have been praying with water every morning and forever. And so, but now there's the science to show, oh yeah, if you talk to water, it actually changes. It's at the molecular level and becomes these beautiful, you know, snowflakes. And so, um, I mean, then we have to just think about ourselves and especially in the institution, we're 70% water. So imagine, number one, the messages we tell ourselves every morning when we look at ourselves in the mirror, what the impact we're having on ourselves at the molecular level, and then imagine the impact you're having on the other people around you and the way that you speak to them, because you are impacting them at the molecular level, at the 70% of water that our body is. And so we have to keep in mind, I think about one of my teachers, um, Jack Forbes, um, my, my mentor, my professor, um, uh, talked about, and, and I think uh, Lutsanea mentioned about how do we approach our work with love? And we're so afraid that somehow love doesn't belong in the academic space. And one thing is uh, that I've also learned um, from my elders is, is you speak to other people as if you're holding an eagle feather and or whatever is sacred to you, that it's in your hand. And that's how you, because would you speak that way to your elder? And so how do we speak to each other? So it's, and so I think what you mentioned, Dangil, about our flowery words, you know, our, um, and our poetry, you know, our, our words matter, the way that we speak to ourselves and the messages we, we speak to others. Thank you, Dr. Luna. Um, so much to say and so much to reflect. We have two more uh, students. Uh, we're gonna start with Liz Anakini and then Lillian Hayner. I'm happy to see both of your faces here on the call. So Liz, if you can, can you unmute yourself? Liz, we lost Liz. There we go. Um, I thank you, Dr. Luna, for sharing some of the examples in how you um, have bridged your work with the community. Um, I was wondering if, if Dr. Grayshield, if you have any thoughts and where you see where you've practiced that or see opportunities um, either at an MSU or in your own uh, current community for that bridging work that you were talking about. I'm not sure if I fully understand the question, like like opportunities for people to themselves to get involved in helping to do bridging work. Um, some of the ways you were talking about um, bridging work between the university and the community. Um, oh, yeah. And any right. places you see opportunities for that. Well, absolutely. I think the university and the local communities have a lot to offer each other by way of local knowledge of the land. And in the universities, the local universities, it would behoove them to really pay attention to the indigenous people and to look at those sacred sites, because those sacred sites, you know, to, in, in, in indigenous ways of looking at it, they're activated, you know, they're places where people go to pray. And we actually found out that where that atom was, was split back in what, the 50s at the Alamogordo um, place. <laughs> My, my brain escapes me all the names of everything, but there's a, there's an energy. There was a Kiva and a Pueblo on top of that. And then it was the only place where the atom could appropriately be split 
because of the energetic structures that came together in the earth. So these sacred sites are located on all those things and the university has a place in assisting with protecting those sites and helping to educate the public on the meaning of them. And the local water, it's absolutely the, the departments of the university that deals with ecology to test that water, talk about that water, try to come with solutions on how we can take care of that water, putting less toxins into the earth to care for that water. I mean, there's, you know, we have, there's so many ways that the communities and that we can partner together to, to bring solutions. You know, I, I see community gardens as the wave of the future, you know, mm -hmm. and, and even community supported agriculture. I mean, those things are a must. They're just a must as we move forward. Not everybody wants to grow food. Somebody else wants to do something different. But I think that, you know, anytime we can create community around shared experiences and bartering kinds of things, you know, that that, that is, doesn't have to be sustained by somebody trying to make money, you know, but that we can actually cultivate that indigenous part of us. I think another way is, is again, it's that shifting what Lisa talks about, shifting the paradigm that um, as researchers and academics, we have our own research interests. We want to go into communities and conduct our research. But we really have to think about instead go to the communities and what is it that you need me to do and not going in with our own agenda, but what's the agenda of the community and and be a servant of, of that community to to help them realize whatever work that needs to be done. So it's it's shifting that, um, you know, we have to figure out and and find out, you know, what are the issues happening in the local community? And I wanted to really just, I wanted just to shout out to Yesi Arenas, my former student who's there and had a question. And I think it kind of connects um, uh, about the self-care and, and connects to what Lisa's saying is that going back to, for me, it's about going back to what is real. And I think about the words of John Trudell um, who, who talked about, um, you know, all these systems, you know, capitalism, money, it's paper, um, political systems, there's systems of manipulation, none of those things are real, that we have to go back to what is real. And, and so it's about earth based and an earth based consciousness. And so all of those things aren't real. So we're part of it, because it's our reality that we live in as society. But we need to Whatever it is, if you're a person who likes the mountains, who likes the forest, who likes well the ocean, the, however the desert, whatever is your place that calls to you, that brings you grounding, you have to go to those places, and that's those are the things. The trees are going to tell you what's the truth. The, they're never going to lie to you. You know they are who they are. Um, the ocean is who it is. It's never going to lie to you. And so you go to those places that are going to tell you the truth, and you ground yourself, and that's how you have self care is that you remind yourself what is real. You put your feet to the earth and you remind yourself that this is real. And so all of those things, you know, we can easily let those slide off of us because we know what's truth and we have to go to that truth. Thank you, Dr. Luna. We started a bit late and technology was a bit funky. So we're gonna go a little bit over. I hope people stay with us. Um, we have some more questions from students. I just wanna share a comment from Dr. Jeanette Haynes Ryder, who's here with us uh, from the College of Education. So happy to have Lisa and Jenny share their brilliance with us, such an honor. It is NMSU's loss to not have kept you here. Thank you for sharing, Jeanette. Um, I want to now go to uh, Lillian Hayner, and then I wanna take a, a student uh, question from the chat. And I think we have more questions coming, but we'll go in that direction. Lillian, Lillian can you unmute? Ms. Hayner. No, I'm trying to... Can someone help me unmute Ms. Hayner? I just got it, thank you. I kept clicking, clicking. Okay, cool. Um, I just wanna say thank you both so much. It's such an honor to be here in this space with you and to hear you talk. So I guess my question is kind of similar to Elizabeth's question about how to get involved in, to the community. So this is more for Dr. Luna. Um, and it's, this is my last semester at NMSU. So I'm graduating this semester. So I guess I'm just trying to like, look at ways how to continue and how to stay involved. And I don't know if it's like the end of the journey or to start a new journey, I guess you could say. And so, uh, Dr. Luna, I know that, you know, there's a lot of controversy Hi. with doula work. Sorry, I have a baby on my lap. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, I just wanted to kind of hear how I could get involved in the community and what you're just what you have to say with the work that you're doing specifically. Sure. Well, the journey is ongoing. It never ends. It just keeps going. <laughs> but um, but in terms of uh, specifically with looking at reproductive justice and, and birth 
for thing. And um, I, I think you're in a great place because New Mexico um, in general um, is a state uh, where health insurance actually does uh, support like midwifery. I mean, I'm in a state where it doesn't. So it's really hard. It's, it's out of pocket. So um, there's a lot of opportunities um, to pursue. And I, and I would say that that's something that you're, um, I mean, we can, I can talk to you later um, if you're interested in that. But I, and I also just encourage if you're an undergraduate um, and you've only, and you've all, and you've lived your whole life in New Mexico, try to go, go to another place, go experience other communities. I think it really helps to um, expand when you learn how other communities, um, you know, their movements, it, it really helps you to bring some of that knowledge coming back to your community. And so I would definitely suggest um, going to different places to experience that. But um, if that's your passion, well, there's lots of pathways um, for that. If it's not, uh, if you're not, if you want to do the midwifery path, if you want to do um, birth work, the policy path, I mean, there's so many different pathways that you can um, work on that. So um, I can definitely talk to you more later too. You can take my email. Thank you for sharing. We have um, a student asking a question, a doctoral student, actually the graduate assistant for Borderlands and Ethnic Studies, uh, Cynthia Wise. She asks, as I work on my dissertation, I'm struggling with advice to not bite the hand that feeds you. Um, and so how do we decolonize our research? How do we navigate that um, process? Either Dr. Gracial, Dr. Luna. <clears throat> Well, I, I would say definitely, you, you, you know, you preface your research with the, the paradigm of, you know, this is a grounded method and you can cite, you know, in, um, a number of things that allows us to have the latitude to really do what we know we need to do in order to work with the communities. That's the bridging work that, we're to, that we talked about. So, um, yeah, I would say that uh, it's important to make sure that you're clear with that philosophical stance. And while it seems completely unfair that you have to do a ton more reading to do that, um, I had a number of students where, you know, until we developed our classes on indigenous ways of knowing, um, you know, we had to look up, we had to substantiate uh, what in, an indigenous paradigm was. And so we can bring in things like grounded method or or Bateman's, you know, Bateman's theory uh, or his information on how to look at the structure of systems. So there is a lot of information that will allow us to have the latitude to do our research. And we do have to be creative, but it's out there. You know, if you, I mean, there, I, I never could understand the, the, the dialogue between qualitative and quantitative in this theory and that theory, you know, for me, it was like, why are we, so concerned about staying to the letter of the law when it comes to something like this. There's so much to research. There's a book called Research as Ceremony, and I, the, the author slips my mind too, but um, there's also indigenous research methodology texts that are, that are um, there's quite a number of them out there now too that talks about our ability to be able to address research from that indigenous perspective. And what is indigenous research? Who does it inform? You know, so all of those questions, when they go in the front of the research and not just us trying to get a dissertation or something, but they go in front of the research, then there's a lot more value in that. And there's plenty of guidelines, you know, and ethics and indigenous research methodology that I was involved in a project with a number of my colleagues to create um, a, a, a structure and considerations for when conducting research from an indigenous paradigm and for and about indigenous communities and those kinds of things. But I think it's good for all of us because the structure, the numbering system that we have in our research right now is fairly, is fairly limited in its ability to assist us with finding solutions to real problems. Thank you. I thought of two, I thought of two examples that just came to mind. One was um, I used to teach high school at Rasa Studies and we would teach them that this is what the answer they want you to have and this is the, the other answer. And so having both the answers, um, you know, when, as we're preparing them for whatever tests or SAT, this is the answer they want you to answer, but this is, here's another, op another option. So having both. And then the other example I was thinking of was I, when I was an undergrad, I was taking a, it was a, it was a class, it was Chicano studies and anthropology. So you had the anthro students and the Chicano studies students fighting all the time. And um, the professor was Dr. Jorge Flor de Alba. He, he had to, we were always fighting it with each other and he had to stop and say, we need to think about this question of authority. And so, you know, you're talking to Chicano students and 
they are the authority of their own story and history. You are an authority from an anthropological perspective. And so it's good to own what are you the authority of? Like if, if you're talking about your own perspective that you're bringing to the research, you're the authority of that. And it's good to own it and to be able to engage that I can, you're the authority of this piece of it. Here's the authority of my piece. And how can I make those bridges? Those are great examples. And you know, to all the students on the call, find the professors that are teaching feminist research methods, indigenous research methods, decolonial research methods. Uh, come, to, come to us in the Borderlands and Ethnic Studies program. We're not the only faculty doing this work, but we can guide you. And, and we're pushing really hard to make these uh, methodologies viable and we're doing it in our own practices. So come talk to us. I wanna get to one last uh, hand I see up, Ana Morales, just because she's been waiting and then that's the end, we'll conclude because I know people need to go have dinner, but I just want to call on Anna because she's been so patient, if that's okay. And if you have to go, that's understandable. Okay, thank, thank you so much for calling on me. Um, well, I, I think first of all, I just want to thank uh, both Dr. Grace Shield and Dr. Luna. Um, your voices are so powerful and it impacted me in so many ways. And I want to take, thank Dr. Um, Bepion for inviting all of his students uh, to here today. It's such an honor. Um, and I think in bits and pieces um, I've heard, you know, and I think even Angel spoke a little bit about this is the power of voice. And it made me, um, hearing your voice being so powerful and just speaking your truth made me reflect a lot on like my voice and at times where maybe it's been too quiet, you know, and and I just wanted to hear maybe your thoughts on um, processes of, of how do you as, as women or Chicana women or men, or it doesn't matter like our positions, like how do we go about it and healing that voice, you know, and, and finding our voice. Um, you know, for me, I think before I even knew the word decolonization, like it started many, many years ago, um, thankfully, cause I, I, I have to say, cause of maybe my ancestors or my abuelita, ceremony came into my life, you know, but it's something that I'm very quiet about, that I'm very timid about, that I just, you know, don't say it. And um, and it's just so beautiful to just see both of your powerful, like, voices and story and the way you just contextualize it. And so if you can offer just that healing process or that knowledge that you may have in, like, healing our voices and, and finding our truth and voice. Thank you. Want to go first, Lisa? You know, the first thing that comes to mind is that when we speak with the end in mind, you know, sometimes some somehow that's the bridge, you know, it's like, I'm going to have a conversation. You know, I, I mean, I, I thought, wow, I'm kind of nervous today. I'm going to be talking to NMSU and I haven't been here since 2017, you know, when I left. And um, and it was a, it was a challenging time for me, and and you know that whole transition was a bit challenging for me, and so, um, but what, but one thing that I and so and so I feel like for a time I kind of lost my voice. I wasn't able to really get to that point, and I think in the healing process of that voice is that what we remember is that the the end result is what we the message that we want to get across. And that way we can get past all of the other stuff. But what is the end? You know, here, I hope that what we are understanding is that we're all, we have the information that we need. You have everything that you need to speak your voice and to speak who you are. And, that, and, and putting that voice out there and practicing that and, and, and knowing that that's coming from your heart. And always just that reflection to me. But the, the measure of the strength of any individual, group, or institution, society, is our ability to self-reflect. That's the most important thing. And then we move on. We use that voice and we move on knowing that the end result of what we want, you know, sometimes that we, I, I lose my voice if my end result is kind of angry or something, you know, it's like I have to make sure that I'm saying, hey, the end result is we're all in this together. So let's, let's, let's bring our gifts together and let's listen to each other, you know? So sometimes we need to listen to the ones who aren't speaking and the ones who speak a lot need to be quiet. <laughs> yes, what you just said right now, Lisa. 
Um, I think um, it's also about, I think what you said about being quiet, it's, that's because we want to be protective of, of a lot of these. And that's, and I, I feel very quiet because I'm very protective. I don't talk about certain things and each of us has to discern what we can share and what we can't. And we don't share it because we're protective of it because this is, this is part of our, our self, our being. Um, and I would say that in terms of, of voice, um, I mean, the first thing is that we're all healing. Like we're always in a state of, of healing. We all, you know, healing either, whether it's the historical trauma, the intergenerational trauma, or it's, you know, the immediate that's happening in your families and in all the things that we go through in life, um, body, mind, and spirit. And so um, the first thing is, is knowing yourself and grounding yourself. And when you know yourself, um, and we're always getting to know new things about ourselves, but when you get to that place of really knowing yourself and, and feeling grounded, nothing can, can shake you. Like that's just, nothing can shake you when you're grounded. Um, nothing can break you, you know, and <laughs> cause this is, cause you have all that you need. You came to this world with everything that you need. And so, um, and when you're and just hold on, hold on to that. And then, um, uh, and also just knowing that you have um, self-determination. And so in every space that you go to, um, you have the self-determination. Um, and that's, you know, that's our, that's, that's our, our human right. Thank you, Dr. Luna. Um, I can feel all the positive energy in this space. Um, I want to invite Dr. Grayshield and Dr. Luna to come to their second home in Las Cruces when things are safer and easier. I feel like we all want to be in a room together and just really be talking and, and feeling and learning. Um, I think we're on a new path for education. We're, de we're redefining it here in this moment. I'm so grateful for your wisdom and for your path and your experience. There's more students with questions on the chat. They may email you. I hope they have the courage to do that. Um, thank you so much um, from my heart. And thank you all for being here tonight. And uh, please uh, join us again on March 10th. We have another speaker, Dr. Timothy Nelson, um, who's speaking on the significance of the Afro frontier um, and Blackdom, New Mexico. So that'll be great in, in March, March 10th. Look for the flyers. Again, thank you. Um, Dr. Luna and Dr. Grayshield, it was beautiful to share time with you and, and have a good night, everyone. Thank you. So good to see everyone. Maybe the speaker should be, stay for one second. After everybody leaves. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.